Hi there and welcome to Biostatistics. So I'm Jonathan Marshall and I'll be your lecturer for the next uh, six weeks or so. Um, here's my contact details. Um, if you do want to uh, contact me, note that I do actually have two offices. So SCB317 is the one that you can come and visit me in, but I do also have an office in uh, the Hopkirk building, which you won't be able to get to. So please give me a call on 84585 or drop me an email um, and uh, we can hook up a time for you to come and see me. Okay, so who am I? I am a statistician here at Massey. I've been here for a number of years. Um, and I'm interested really in, in um, modeling, the, uh, modeling disease, really. So I'm um, very excited as well as being a little bit um, stressed um, <laughs> over the COVID outbreak because this is kind of, you know, one area that I'm um, interested in, in modeling. Most of my um, modeling work is in foodborne disease. So things like campylobacteriosis, for example, um, where I'm typically interested in um, in modelling outbreaks. So uh, essentially trying to estimate the average trend in where you would expect cases to be um, spatially. So in which places in New Zealand would you expect cases to be? Because not all areas in New Zealand um, have equal risk. So for example, if you're in a... Um, in an area that uh, is generally more well off, then you actually have higher risk of campylobacteriosis because you tend to eat uh, things such as more fresh chicken than um, perhaps other people in areas which aren't perhaps so well off um, may eat frozen chicken, and of course freezing the chicken will kill the campylobacter. Uh, that sort of thing. Um, and once you estimate the uh, sort of the trends, both in time and space, um, then you're interested in highlighting where where you get cases that don't fit that trend because those cases may, may then be sort of a common outbreak um, that you can then you know, use the public health people, um, the good people that we have um, tracking down COVID cases to uh, you know, contact those people and see if there's a common source of, or, or, of the infection. You know, did they all uh, visit the same restaurant or did they all um, eat uh, the same sort of brand of, of product that might be contaminated or something? And the other thing I'm interested in is source attribution, which is essentially, given you have disease, where did you get it from? And so that uses the genomic information, so um, essentially the, uh, the genetic code, if you like, of the bacteria that we find in humans. And we also find that same bacteria in a number of other things, such as in chickens or in cows or sheep or in rivers or, and so on in the environment. And so we can compare those uh, the sort of the patterns that we get in the genetic code across those things. And then for each, every human case, we can kind of identify where the most likely source is, okay? Um, these are my pets. This is Minnie the dog, Chili the cat, and Sam the kid, who obviously isn't a pet. Um, if you want, you can click on Minnie to find some more photos on her Instagram. Okay, so the key things that we're gonna be learning um, uh, today are going to be um, Basically, I'll go through what the key idea of statistics is, which is quantifying variation, and then we'll start looking at different types of data that, you, that we might get and how we can summarize those, um, particularly focusing today on quantitative data or numeric measures. Okay, so, so what is statistics? Well, statistics is all really about um, quantifying how much variation there are in a particular measure. And the idea being that the numbers by themselves are often fairly meaningless, um, and are often restricted to the context and it's only when you take into account the variation of those numbers in general in the population if you like that you can start telling things um, about you know how, how, how good or bad a particular measure is so for example with COVID okay we know in New Zealand there's been 1400 um, confirmed cases to date you know, by itself, that doesn't kind of give us much information. But if we compare that to other countries in the world, we can see that New Zealand's doing, in fact, extremely well, right? So per population basis, we're one of the um, lowest number of cases in the world. Um, that's the sort of thing that, that statistics allows us to do. So here's a kind of a silly example. And uh, we've got 10 pin bowling. Um, so my score over the my average score over the last five games is 137. And you know, unless you know a lot about 10 pin bowling, that wouldn't really tell you anything, you know, like how the scoring system works and all that sort of thing. And so one way we can look at that is we could just compare um, my average score to the average score of others in order to gauge, you know, am I a, a really rubbish 
uh, bowler or am I a good bowler or just somewhere in the middle, right? So the key concept is how much variation is there between bowlers and that's what's going to really tell us the answer. So suppose the average bowling score was around 100, we might get scores that um, that are distributed like this. So this is a histogram for the bowling scores of a bunch of different people. You can see that it's centered around about 100 and there's quite a bit of spread. Okay, so that we've got numbers as low as sort of in the 40s and 50s down here and numbers in the, uh, you know, between 150 and 160 up there. And if that was the distribution, then when we compare what my number is, 137, you see that I'm quite a good bowler, right? I'm in the, sort of in the top end of the possible scores. But perhaps on the other hand, maybe bowling scores are actually centred um, at a higher average. So here if we're centering them at say 160 or 170, we get sort of spread just like we had before, but we're getting some bowlers score over 220 and some are down at about, a, you know, between 110 and 120 down here. And from this you can see that actually I'm not a very good bowler, right? And so it's by quantifying the sort of the, the spread, the variation in, in the measure that we are able to make a conclusion about whether I'm a good bowler or not. And we see uncertainty all the time. So this year is an election year. Okay, you have to vote on a number of things. For example, you have to vote on um, whether you think the, uh, the, um, that uh, cannabis uh, should be uh, legalised, so that's one of the referendums, whether you think um, that uh, euthanasia should be legal. Um, obviously, you need to vote for someone in your, um, in your local electorate, so who you want to represent your electorate, and of course, um, who you want in, in government uh, as far as your party vote goes. Uh, so those are very important votes. And of course, you've also got Bird of the Year to vote in. Remember Bird of the Year? Make sure you vote in Bird of the Year. Um, we might look at some of that data later. It's quite, it's quite a fun data set. And when you look at um, polling, for example, um, across time, um, you know, we try and gauge voting intention of people before the election happens in, in order to kind of predict the future, if you like. And so we get this, you know, every, every um, sort of month or so, um, you know, you get a new poll out and of course the political reporters breathlessly report on this new poll and compare it to the last one and, you know, say that, you know, National Party is improving or the ACT Party has gone up or whatever, right, compared to the other one. And one of the things they don't really talk about very much is trend and how much uncertainty there is associated with the poll. So they normally mention uncertainty. Um, so there's a margin of error associated with the poll, which is usually about plus or minus 3%. So um, what that means statistically is you're sort of 95% confident that um, that the truth, i.e. The, the result of the election, should it be held on the same day as the poll was, um, would be within kind of plus or minus 3% of what the poll says, right? Um, but in fact, that's actually just kind of a statistical thing, and it's not accounting for many, many things, such as the fact that the poll uh, likely, uh, the people in the poll are likely going to be different to the people in the population uh, that votes in a particularly biased way. And of course, the pollsters are very, very good at trying to correct for this, but nonetheless, by correcting for it, they're going to increase the uncertainty, increase the variation in the actual uh, result compared to their predicted result. So this plot here just shows us all of the polls um, sort of, you know, over the last almost 20 years now um, in New Zealand. And, and one thing you notice is that there's quite a lot of spread. So, um, you know, the spread around the National Party trend, this is the, the blue one here, is around about kind of 12%. So it's plus or minus 6% instead of being plus or minus 3%, which is what we'd expect um, sort of from the size of the poll. And similarly, the spread and everything else is the same. And the other th interesting thing is that the vast amount of correlation here is between the is between the National Party and the Labour Party, right? So if the National Party is going up, the Labour Party is going down and vice versa, right? So this is the Jacinda effect here, right? This dramatic increase in the popularity of the Labour, Labour Party after, they, um, after Jacinda Ardern became leader. You can see, of course, in recent uh, months, they're extremely popular due to the, the um, COVID response whereas the National Party currently is, is unpopular. And you can see here's New Zealand First and the Green Party, right? 
Okay, so the interesting thing here, I think, is not necessarily where the, where the trend is, though obviously as a political scientist you might be interested in that, but rather the uncertainty about the trend and the fact that we don't really talk about that uncertainty all that much when we're reporting on polls, right, because that's not an interesting story from a politics perspective. So really, I guess um, the main thing that we want to get out of this course is that, um, is that you remember that quantifying variation in data is really the key thing that you need to be able to do okay so if you can remember that um, we'll, we'll have done well and that's called it sort of the key goal that we'll, we'll have as we go through is we're trying to describe the variation that we see in the data and by doing so we can then answer questions with a certain level of confidence okay so we're going to be looking at um, the types of data uh, that we might be presented with and really it forms falls into two groups so your data are, are either going to be a numeric measure of something uh, so that's quantitative data or they're going to be a name or a label or a category of something which will be qualitative data right so um, each of these things can be broken down a little bit um, more so for example qualitative data might have an order associated with it such as grades cattle body scores for example would be an example of ordinal data where you know essentially it's um, small counts for example or a rating system you know and really the, the idea of determining whether something's ordinal is just think about how you present it on a on a graph or in a table you know is there an obvious order that makes sense if there is then it's probably ordinal data uh, nominal data is just anything that doesn't have an order just anything where it's just a name okay so um, you know, eye colour and all that sort of stuff is, is an example of nominal data. I guess names are nominal data, right? And quantitative data or measure data or numeric data, um, that again can be, um, can be split up. Um, it can either be treated as being continuous, where you can sort of get decimal places, if you like, or fractions of a whole, or it can be discrete, where, um, where you typically only get whole numbers, such as when you're counting things. Um, now, typically, there's not really any difference in how you deal with these two types of data, um, at least in the context of this course. Um, there are some small differences in how you, how you um, maybe play with discrete data, particularly if your counts are very small. If your counts are large, then you don't really care that they're discrete. Um, you can treat them as if they're continuous. And similarly, the difference between ordinal and nominal is really just down to how you present the data. Um, if it's ordinal data, so if there's an order that's a, you know important, then it makes sense to display it in the way that you know, in the way that the order is is kept um, in sync. So when we have data, um, one of the key things is that the data by themselves are usually not all that useful, and instead we want to take that data and summarize it in a way that's useful, and. We basically use either um, numeric measures or uh, graphics um, for this. Personally, I favor using graphics whenever we can, even if what you're putting on the graphic is just an average or some uncertainty associated with an average. Uh, but the key thing when you're summarizing data is that you want to capture the variation as well as the center, as well as where the kind of the average is. The average by itself is not all that useful um, because you don't know whether there's lots of spread associated with that average, so lots of variation around that average, or whether kind of all the data is about the same as the average anyway. In the latter case, right, if all the data is about the same as the average, then the average by itself is okay. But in the former case, if there's lots of spread around the average, then you want to know what that, that spread is so that you can kind of make an honest decision. So we're going to start by looking at quantitative data. Uh, that's numeric measures. And um, really there's a couple of numeric summaries that we'll be looking at and a couple of graphical summaries that we're looking at. And I've just spotted that I don't have another one listed here. We'll also look, look at uh, density plots as well as histograms and box plots. Um, so the numeric summaries that we'll be looking at will be measures of center and spread. So measures of center are basically where are the typical values or where are the kind of the middle of the data. What's the, the, the value in the data that comes up the most perhaps or um, is sort of the, the average in some way and measures of spread, which will be measuring range or um, kind of how the, the observations are scattered around that measure of centre. So we typically have three measures of centre. Um, 
there are more than this, but this is enough sort of um, to get the idea. Um, so we've got three here, the mean, the median, and the mode. Now the mode is just the most popular item. So it's the most frequently appearing um, number in the data, if you like. That's the mode. Uh, the median is the middle value. So that's if you, were, uh, if you sort all the values in the data from smallest to largest. And then you just run through until you find the middle most one in terms of the rank. Uh, then you take the value associated with that rank and that would be the median, right? So if you had five numbers, right, and you put them in order, the third number would be the middle, right? Or if you have um, 10 numbers and you put them in order, then the middle one would be somewhere between the fifth and the sixth, okay? So you normally go kind of halfway in between those two. Uh, the mean, on the other hand, is kind of the most mathematically convenient of the measures of center in terms of kind of what you can do with it mathematically um, and that's uh, the sum of the observations so the sum of the numbers the values divided by the number okay so that's what this um, funny um, piece of uh, greek symbols is here right the xi these is this is just this just re represents the ith number in the data so uh, that's what the xi means and then a sigma here means add up so that's short for sum. So sum of all the numbers divided by n, which is the number of them, right? So that's the that's the mean. So for example, here's 15 numbers um, that I've just picked from one to 10 at random. So I've got a list of 15 numbers. Then we can just identify each of these measures of, of, um, of center, can't we? So the median, uh, to find the median, we put them in all in order. So you can see that the smallest number here is a one, and then we're gonna have a two, and then we're gonna have a bunch of threes, and then a four and a five and so on. So we put them in order. And because we've got 15, uh, the eighth one will be the middle, so that there's seven on either side, and that'll be five, all right? So the middle observation is the median, the median is the number five in this data set. Uh, the mode will be the most frequent, so in this case it's the number three, right? Because three appears four times in this data set, and the next most frequent would be eight. Okay, so that's the mode. And the mean would be the total, so add the, all the numbers up, divided by how many there are, which is 15. So we add them all up, divide by 15, and we get 5.13. So that's the mean. Um, so one thing to note is that the mean doesn't have to be a value that's in your data. Okay, it's just a sort of an abstraction, if you like, in that respect. Okay, we had all whole numbers, but the mean is not a whole number. Whereas in this case, the, me, the mode and the median were both whole numbers. So that's just a slight, a slight aside. Um, we can kind of extend the idea of the median, right? The median is halfway through the data um, to other places through the data, right? So we could find, you know, what's a quarter of the way through the data. Uh, well, that's the lower quartile, which in this case would be the number three, okay? And what's three quarters of the way through the data? Well, that would be the upper quartile, which is the number eight. Okay, so if you need to find them by hand, which you'll never have to do in this course, but maybe you will in some other thing that you're doing, then all you do to find the lower quartile and the upper quartile is you find the median first, right? And to find the lower quartile, you then just find the median of all of the numbers below the uh, lower quartile, uh, the, the uh, median, sorry. To find the upper quartile, it's the median of everything above the median, right? It's halfway through the second half of the data. And this is kind of can be extended to quantiles. So these are quartiles, which divides the data into quarters. Uh, quantiles divide the data into hundredths, if you like. So the 95th quantile will be the value that appears 95% of the way through the, through the ordered data. Right? So the, the same thing um, can apply to whatever percentile you want or quantile that you want. So that's measures of center. So we have the median, mode, and mean. Um, we've also got measures of spread. Okay, and so here's a list of four different measures of spread. Uh, the range, that's maybe the easiest to get the hang of. That's just the, the biggest value minus the smallest value. Okay, so back in our data back here, it's going to be 10 minus 1, which is 9. Um, so that's kind of the easy one to do. Um, this one down the bottom here, the interquartile range, is the upper quartile minus the lower quartile. So in this case, it's going to be 8 minus 3, so it's going to give you the number 5. Um, and then the two others are kind of similar to the to the mean and how they're computed. 
um, that's the variance and the standard deviation. And again, these are the kind of the more mathematically convenient ones to deal with. Um, so they have properties that are nice from a mathematics perspective, but to actually get them, you've got to do a bunch of maths, right? Now, again, I want to point out that we're not going to be doing this by hand, okay? You will not be expected to do this sort of computation by hand. We've got computers for that, and we will be taking advantage of the fact that we have computers. Um, and so we'll be doing everything on the computer, not um, by hand, not even on a calculator, all right? So uh, let's just have a look at this formula, though, and see if we can kind of figure out what it's, what it's computing. So again, remember that xi is the, is the value of the ith observation. Um, x bar here is the mean, right? So this is xi minus the mean. That's the distance from the ith observation to the mean. And then we square that. So it's the squared distance of the observation to the mean, and we add them up. So that's the sum of the square distances to the mean. And then we divide by n, so that's the mean of the squared distance from the mean. So it's the mean square error, if you like, the mean square variation of the observations around the point. The standard deviation is then just the square root of that. Okay, so you square root both sides, you just get sigma here, which is the usual sim symbol that we use for standard deviation is sigma, just like x bar is the symbol that we use for the mean. Okay, and it's just the square root of that thing. Okay, and of course the computer knows how to compute these for us, so we don't really have to have to deal with the formulas. They're just so that you can kind of get some grasp as to what this thing is measuring. So in this case, it's measuring distance of each observation, sort of average distance to the to the mean, if you like. So you can see that that's a measure of variation. Okay, now all of these, uh, so we've got all of these different measures of center and measures of spread, um, and they have different properties. So they have, um, they're sort of reliable in different ways. So this is the the idea of a robust summary. And to get to the idea of the robust summary, the first thing we have to understand is how these measures can be influenced by extreme observations or outliers. So outliers or extreme observations are typically isolated data points, so you only have one or two of them usually, that lie uh, far away from the bulk of the data. So they might be extreme values, so super tall people, for example, or super short people, um, or uh, houses that are super, you know, mansions, or houses that are really, um, you know, about to be knocked down, um, you know, would have a very, very high price or a very low price. Okay, so they'll be extreme values. Or they may indicate a, an error with data entry. So, for example, um, you know, when you were typing in the, the age of a person, you accidentally put another zero on the end, and someone's now, you know, 400 years old instead of 40 years old. Okay. And um, these extreme observations affect some of our measures very greatly, right? So they're going to affect the mean, the standard deviation, and the variance a whole heap. But they're not going to affect the median, or usually the mode, or the interquartile range very much at all. Take a minute to just think about why this might be. Why would extreme values affect the mean, and the variance, but not affect the median and the interquartile range. Have a think about that. Okay, well, the reason is going to be because the mean and the standard deviation and variance use the values, right, in their computation. So the mean is the sum of the values divided by the total. The, um, the variance is the sort of the distance in terms of the value from the value to the mean squared, right? So... Those things, because they use the values themselves, they're going to be affected if those values are extremely big or extremely small, because an extremely big value is going to contribute a lot to uh, those statistics, right? Because they use those values. The median, on the other hand, does not use the values, it uses the order or the rank in the data, right? And so all you do is you order the data, you don't care about what the numbers are other than the fact that they have to be in order. And so the extreme values go at each end, right? And if the extreme values are at each end, they're not going to affect the middle, the median. And similarly, they're not going to affect the interquartile range because, again, that's in the middle of the data. It doesn't depend on the ends of the data, right? So here's an example where we take our original data, right, which has median 5, mean 5.13, and these are what the standard deviation and interquartile range are. 
and um, we change them by adding a new observation 20 which is clearly outside the range of the, re the, the original data this is an extreme although not too extreme observation you can see that it, it barely changes the median but it changes the mean quite a bit right it's increased by almost one unit it's changed the standard deviation a whole heap it's almost doubled it but it hasn't affected the interquartile range very much okay so from this we'd conclude that um, in the presence of this extreme value the value of the mean and the standard deviation has changed a bunch whereas the median and interquartile range have basically stayed where they were so we would say that the median and interquartile range are robust to extreme values whereas the mean and the standard deviation are not okay so robust measures are ones that aren't affected too much by extreme values Non-robust measures such as the mean um, are ones that are affected by uh, large values. And so when you do have the presence of outliers in your data, it pays to, um, to perhaps uh, sort of redo any analyses you do both with and without those values in the data so that you can see if they're influencing things too much. And we'll get to that a little bit um, towards the end when we look at linear modelling. Okay, and the last uh, thing we're going to look at is the five number summary. And that just brings together things we've already mentioned, which is um, the median. Okay, that's a measure of center. Uh, the quartiles. Okay, the lower quartile and the upper quartile, as well as the smallest and the biggest number, the minimum and the maximum. Right, so those are five numbers. We just keep those five and kind of sort of ignore the rest of the data and those five numbers by themselves do a pretty good job of summarizing a numeric measure because we have measures of center we've got the mean uh, the median we've got measures of spread because we can see what the range and the interquartile range are uh, but we also have a measure of shape and i'll get back to this a little bit when we look at box plots okay but basically we can tell what the shape of the distribution is just using these five numbers particularly if we display them graphically in a box plot Okay, so looking at uh, things graphically, uh, we're going to look at um, three different plots, histograms, density plots, and box plots. So we'll start with a histogram. So here's one here. Um, and basically what this consists of is um, it's a summary of a numeric measure. So we have a numeric measure here that takes values uh, by the looks between about 120 and 220, roughly. Okay, so that's sort of the range of the data. The middle of the data is at about 100 and sort of 60, 170 maybe. Okay, and there's a spread from about 120 up to 220, and it's mostly symmetric in that it's, uh, you know, most of the values are sort of centered where the middle of the data are, and it's about the same distance away from each end. And so what this um, histogram does is it basically uh, takes uh, the data and it divides the range of the data up into little intervals, okay, which are called bins. Okay, so for example, back here we divided it into a range, maybe it's maybe it's 115 to 120, and then it's 120 to 130, all right, and 130 to 135 or something, all right? So divide it into little little boxes, if you like, and then we basically put each observation into which box it is in and count them. So we count the number of observations in each box and that's what the vertical height is right so most of the observations most popular observations are in this bar here okay um, there's a couple of things that we need to control when we do a histogram and one of those is how many bins should we use so should we use um, however many there are here it looks as to be about 16 or 17 there or should we use more bins or fewer bins right so that's one decision that we need to make and the other decision we need to make is where should we start the first bin, right? So if our observation is maybe, you know, we um, maybe it's down at 115 maybe, you know, should we start down at 110 or should we start bang on 115? So there's could it sort of scope to move that first bin and then there's scope to say how wide each bin is, which will define how many bins there are. But after that, it takes care of itself. And one thing to note is when we're doing things with RStudio, which is the software that we'll use, um, it will default to using 30 bins, which is usually not a good number to use. And so it pays to specify the number of bins. 
Okay, so here's a little app that we built in order to show you the, the effect of changing the number of bins on some data. So here we have some data and by the look there's, there's 10 bins. Um, if I increase the number of bins, then you can see that I see quite a different picture. This is the same data. So it's the same data being plot plotted. So here it is again with 10 bins and here it is with 20. You can see that maybe my conclusion is a little bit different, right? So when I had 10 bins here, I'd be concluding that maybe there's, you know, maybe two humps here, right, in the data. Two main humps, so one centered down here and one centered up here. Whereas with 20 bins, maybe I'm saying there's actually three humps, right? So my conclusion is changing a little bit based on the number of bins. Um, it doesn't change all that much with the bin start, but can be a little bit different. Um, typically that's less of an issue than the, than the number of bins, but it's just something to be aware of, okay? Uh, so here's another data set. And again, if I reduce the number of bins, then in this case, it, it, my conclusion probably isn't changing, right, all that much, right? So in, in all these cases here, I'm mostly getting a single hump uh, until maybe I get way too many bins and I get, you know, a very noisy picture. So the number of bins really is a trade-off between trying to be super accurate. So, um, so this here is super accurate in terms of... Uh, in terms of we know exactly where data are so for example we know there's exactly one observation down here right because that bar is of height one and there's exactly two here and one next to it right so we've got a lot of accuracy about where the data are but it's not summarizing the data well right it's not you know, we see all the all of the noise in the data but we don't see the overall it's harder to see the overall trend or the overall picture whereas if i reduce the, the number of bins I can much more easily see the overall picture, but it's harder for me to spot exactly where the individual data points are. And of course, in the extreme, if I knock it down to just a few bins, then I start losing information altogether. Right, so small number of bins, you have no information. Large number of bins, you've got lots of information, but lots of noise. So there's kind of some happy medium where you get, um, you know, you, you get to display both the overall shape of the data or where the data are without it being sort of too spiky or too too noisy. And there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer. Um, it's more just, um, you know, so I would recommend kind of exploring using di a different number of bins. We'll see how to do this um, in the labs. Um, use a different number of bins just to make sure that what you're presenting to the reader um, is not uh, sort of dependent only on that number of bins. So, you know, if, you, if you're wanting to go for about 15 bins, you know, try 20, try 10, make sure your overall conclusion is the same. And as long as your overall conclusion is the same, then go with whichever one you want. Okay, so that's a histogram. Um, again, we'll see more of this um, when we look at the labs. So given the histogram, we can kind of describe shape as well as center, right? So center is where kind of the bulk of the data are, so that's probably going to be around here. Um, we can describe spread as kind of the sort of the range of the data, but we can also describe shape. We can describe whether things are symmetric or whether things are skewed to the right or skewed to the left or, or whatever. Okay. So um, skew to the left is where um, where you have a long tail to the left, and most of the data are bunched on the right hand side of the plot. Skew to the right is where you have a long tail to the right and most of the, the data are bunched onto the left hand side of the plot. Um, then you can describe things like the, um, the number of bumps you get, right? So is it, a, is it a single bump, okay, which is called unimodal, so that's one mode or one most common value, or is it bimodal, does it have two bumps, okay? Um, when describing the graph, mention the shape, the center, and the spread, okay? So for example, let's have a new data set, maybe this one here, um, then I would be saying that, uh, let's just try a different, few different bins. Okay, mostly consistent answer. Okay, so I'd be saying that the center here is at about, um, you know, between zero and one, would be where the center is. Uh, the spread is from about minus two up to about three. And it's mostly symmetric, isn't it? Okay, it's mostly sort of the same shape on either side. What you're looking for is kind of, um, uh, sort of the average. You, um, we don't want to be too specific because um, typically you'll only have a sample of data and not the whole data set. So you don't want to be too specific. Um, you just want to kind of describe um, just the general picture of what you see. Okay, so 
focus on shape centered spread we'll have some practice for this in the in the labs so in summary for histograms um, they're, they're pretty good really um, histograms are okay except for the fact that they're a little bit noisy because you get that steppiness right and the real true data distribution is probably smoother than this okay and so that steppiness is, a, is an artifact of how we draw them okay um, they're good for distributions with two or more peaks right because you're actually seeing the shape of the distribution so you can see where there's two peaks in the data um, and there's a slight kind of downside where you have to join uh, choose the number of bars the number of bins that you want to use and um, which which number of bins you choose might give you quite different pictures um, now it's usually only a problem if the data set is small and of course if the data set is small then perhaps your conclusions from it need to be reasonably weak anyway because you don't have much data when data sets um, get large then this is less of a problem okay the other case is when data may have been rounded so when data may have been rounded then your observations are at whole numbers and so what can happen is um, when you're dividing up the bins is um, you could divide it exactly where data are so that the data all go in the left bin or the right bin okay it'll kind of consistently make the same choice um, in which case you often get very different pictures as you change the number of bins so it's just something to be what, uh, aware of when you have rounded data you can get quite different pictures when you when you change the number of bins okay the other one we're going to look uh, look at is the kernel density plot and this is really essentially just kind of a, a smooth version of the histogram okay so how this works is that um, instead of dividing the range of the data up into little bins like the histogram does instead we kind of work the other way and we start with where the data are and we build up our picture from each data point and we do that by kind of dropping a little blob of um, of uh, jelly if you like on to each data point and then you kind of add all the blobs up across all the data and you get some smooth shape right so we'll, we'll um, have a look at how this does it um, so here's um, for instance the bowling scores data we've got our first data point down here at about 153 uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to drop a little blob of jelly next to that okay then we're going to get and that's going to be our the red curve then is going to be our uh, our density our kernel density estimate now we've got two observations we're going to drop a blob on each one and then our density estimate will be the combination of them and we just keep repeating that process we drop another observation and because this one is quite close to the previous one when we drop our little blobs on top they overlap and so they're going to add up and we're going to get a bigger blob there overall okay and you just repeat this process dropping little blobs of jelly and adding them up and as you go you get an idea as to the shape of that distribution okay so this is where we have many many observations we get this sort of shape of the pattern okay so you can see in this case it's centered um, at about 170 odd um, there's, a, there's a range from 120 to 220 okay and there's a slight um, sort of increase on the right hand side so it's, it's mostly symmetric isn't it okay so this kind of overcomes the sort of the steppiness that the histogram had um, and it replaces the um, the choice of number of bins in the histogram with a choice of sort of how wide each of those blobs should be okay so here's an example so here's some data down the bottom which is um, shown in this little um, this is called a data rug it's just a little you get a little line where each data point is and this is what the shape of it is and you can essentially choose um, so it's called the bandwidth um, you can choose a sort of how wide um, those blobs of jelly are if you like and that basically controls the amount of smoothing that you have so if you uh, choose a small amount of smoothing then you get a very unsmooth curve right you get a very jagged curve whereas if you choose a large amount of smoothing then you get a very flat curve with no features so again the kind of the optimal point is somewhere between these two extremes right so if you go all the way down the bottom then you know each of these little spikes is telling you exactly where a data point is essentially 
but it's a super noisy measure, right? There's lots of variation. And you can imagine that if you got a, a, a new version of this data set, you went out and collected a, a, another data set from the same population, it'll be slightly different, right, the data set. And so the picture you end up with will look quite a lot different, right, because it's very spiky. It depends on exactly where each observation is. Whereas if you smooth it a lot, right, then you see no detail here, right? All we see is a big flat blob, okay? Um, if you went out and collected another data set and used the same summary, you're going to get almost exactly the same blob, right? So here you're not going to have much sample to sample variation, um, but again, but there's not really any detail from either of the samples. So there's some happy medium uh, between the two, one where you get no information or very little information, but it doesn't change much from sample to sample, and the others where you get like way too much information and it changes a lot from sample to sample, it's too noisy, and that's sort of in the middle. And generally I find that you don't tend to have to um, muck around with the bandwidth um, very much. It tends to typically um, choose a good value anyway, um, but nonetheless it's sort of a, a thing that you can twiddle with if you wish. Okay, so that's the, the kernel density estimate or a density. We'll see how to do that um, in lab two, I think. So um, the advantages of a kernel density plot is it has a, a better signal to noise ratio than the histogram. The histogram um, is a bit blocky, so you get a little bit more noise than you might otherwise want. Um, again, it has the same benefit, so it's good if you just two or more peaks in the data, you can see both peaks. And it fixes the problem with choosing the number of bins and where the bins start, but you still have to um, choose the smoothing bandwidth. Typically the default for the smoothing bandwidth is pretty good and so you don't usually have to worry about it too much. Okay and the last um, graphical summary measure we'll use for this type of data, numeric data, is the box plot. And the box plot essentially plots the five number summary. Okay so it plots the median which is that darker line there it plots uh, the quartiles, which is uh, the, the lower quartile was the bottom of the box. The upper quartile was the right-hand side of the plot, or so the top of the box, if it's orientated the other way around. Uh, the length of the box is the interquartile range. And then it plots the smallest value and the largest value. Okay, so it gives a good, simple summary of the data. And it's particularly good when you have multiple groups to compare. Right, because you can easily put box plots next to each other, right? And you can put as many that you know you can sort of put ten box plots next to each other without a problem. Whereas it's going to be quite difficult to to structure things such that you such as that you can easily compare ten histograms, for example. Like would you put them side by side or above each other? You know, ten of them is going to be a lot of stuff on the page. Whereas ten box plots isn't a lot of stuff on the page because each one is isn't made up of all that many features. Um, now, box plots typically do um, a little bit more than just the five number summary. You can see here we've got a, um, a separate point marked um, as a distinct point. Um, and this is an, um, an outlier. Um, and the reason it's been plotted um, as an outlier is due to the algorithm that's used for box plots. So what the box plot does is it puts the median, the lower quartile, the upper quartile on. Right, so it creates the box and puts the middle of it in, the median. It then computes the, the length of that box, which is the interquartile range, and it stretches it out by a multiple multiplication of 1.5, and it takes that 1.5 times the interquartile range from, the, uh, from each end of the box. So it takes it from this end, goes 1.5 interquartile ranges up, and then anything past that limit is going to be marked individually as a potential outlier. Same from the bottom, so you take the interquartile range, you multiply it by one and a half, and you take it down here. It's going to be down here somewhere. And anything past that point, which in this case there isn't any, would become an outlier. Okay, Any outline points is marked as a dot, and then you take the, um, the whisker, which is this bit here, or the tails of the box plot, these bits on either side of the box, you take it out to the maximum or minimum observation um, that you haven't already marked, so the one you know, once you've ignored the outliers, if you like. Now, I will note that this 1.5 times rule is somewhat arbitrary, okay? Um, and my general rule is don't freak out about outliers, okay? In this case, I wouldn't be particularly worried about this one because it's sort of as far away from the median as the minimum is anyway, right? So it's not too 
too far away, right? So I wouldn't be too worried about this um, one. Um, and it has to be kind of really bad before you start bothering to point it out. So I wouldn't probably wouldn't even mention this one, okay, um, at all. Now, one thing to be aware of with box plots is because it summarizes the data so uh, succinctly, right? It only summarizes it into those five numbers essentially. Then you've got to be really careful about shape. In particular, your assumption when you look at a box plot is that there's only one hump or one peak or one mode in the data and that's you assume that that mode is within the box and that may not be the case so in this case uh, this example here where i've put the histogram and the box plot on top of it um, it is the case there's only one hump so i would say that both the histogram and the box plot are giving me similar information but the box plot of course is far simpler however it may well be that we get two box plots that look the same but the underlying data is actually very different. So here the underlying data is just has kind of a, a single peak, not a very high one at that, it's fairly uniform. Whereas here there's clearly two peaks and we can't tell that from looking at the box plot. In fact, the box plots look almost identical. Okay, so one thing to be aware of when you're summarizing data with a box plot is that you're assuming that there's a single mode or a single hump in the data, a single peak so if the data do not have that shape, then a box plot is not appropriate. Okay, so just think about the data that you have and whether there'd be a single peak. Use a histogram or a kernel density uh, plot to, um, to, to assess that. And then, you know, if there's no problem, then, you know, you can be happy to go ahead with a box plot. Uh, if there is, then a box plot may be not, a, not important. Um, so the last thing that a box plot can tell you is it can tell you, um, first of all, about outliers. So here we have some here and here, and skew, shape, okay? So um, I don't think any of these are outliers that I'd really um, be talking about too much um, because almost always when the, when the shape is not symmetric, you'll often end up with outliers. So here we have a symmetric box plot. It's symmetric basically because the sort of the the length of the of the um, of the tails here on either side are about the same and you know the amount in the middle here the the, the uh, median is about in the middle of the box right it's um, again notice that I'm saying about a lot here I'm being vague right I'm I'm not freaking out about things that um, unless they're going to be really quite extreme all right um, that's generally a rule when you're evaluating plots uh, don't um, sort of point things out that may only be a feature of the data that you've got here and that if you went and collected a different data set that feature would no longer be there right and that's you, you you're trying to sort of talk about the population of the thing you're looking at not the, the specific sample that you have so just allow it to be a little bit um, vague so so look at it um, squint a little if it helps okay allow things to not be perfect because nothing will ever be perfect Okay, um, now in terms of shape, this uh, top one here is right skew. So what we mean by that is that these are, is that these extreme values tend to happen on the right hand side or at the higher values compared to the lower values. Right. So here we've got observations that are a long way from the median on the right. So that's right skew. This one's left skew. So you've got values that are a long way from the median on the left. Okay. So what I typically am using to evaluate this is kind of where's the position of the median within the box and where's the position of the box within the range, right? So here, the box is to the left, right? The long tail is to the right and the median is to the left as well, right? This side of the box is much bigger than this one. So the bigger ones are the, where the skew is. So this is right skew. Uh, this one is slightly left skew. I'd say it's not as extreme as this one, right? And that the the median is um, is not is uh, is sort of not to the right or um, all that much, uh, but the box is clearly to the right of the range. Okay, there's a bigger tail to the left, so this would be left skew, but perhaps not strongly so. Okay, and we have an, a wee app here that you can play with in order to get a sense of of where things are different. Okay, so here um, we have to select the graph which has a different center. Okay, so on each of these plots, um, one of them 
uh, shows no difference between the groups. One of them shows a difference in center, one of them shows a difference in spread, and one of them shows a difference in shape. So which one do you think has the different center? Have a think about that for a while. If you've got the slides, feel free to play with it. Click on the one that you think is right. I'm going to go for the blue. And I was right. right? We get the green tick. Uh, I was correct here. Um, let's have a look at an another one. Let's find the difference in center here. Uh, so the difference in center here, I think, is probably this yellow one, maybe? Yes. That showed a difference in center, right? You can see that uh, this group here is moved towards the right compared to this other one. Okay, and if you want to try other things, so we could look for the difference in spread. Let's have another data set. Then the ones that have a difference in spread, I think, in this case, is probably this grey one. Right? This one here has a bigger spread than this one here. Right? The spreads here are all about the same. And difference in shape. Okay, so difference in shape, I think the answer is probably going to be... This green one, I think, right? Because this one here is very slightly skewed to the left, while this one here is very skewed, to, is uh, quite a bit more skewed to the right. All of the others have about the same shape. Okay. Uh, if you get it wrong, so let's have a look. Uh, so here's here's the right answer, right? This is the difference in shape. Let's pick this one instead. Then it will tell you what the answer is. So feel free to play with this and get it, uh, sort of get your eye in if you like. It does take practice. Um, to sort of identify, you know, is there a difference here and is there not? My advice is to generally um, err on the there's no difference side of things. So if you see something, um, you know, an effect, a difference in, in box plots or whatever uh, between two groups and it's not very strong, then say so, right? Say there doesn't really seem to be much of a difference in center here. Okay, don't try and find small things in the plot that are different. Instead, try and find big things in the plot that are different. And remember to overall comment on center, shape, and spread. We'll have some practice for this in the lab. So overall, box plots um, are pretty good. They are particularly good in the case where you're comparing multiple groups because you can put the, si the box plots side by side. Okay? You've got to be very careful if the data has more than one peak because the box plot can be very misleading in that case. Uh, if the data only has one peak, then the box plot can give you a very good summary of where the center is, how much spread there is, and what the shape is. You know, is it skewed to the left or skewed to the right? And that's it.